Well, good morning. Some of you uh, that are here this morning, I'm looking around, and I know that some of you are old enough to remember the uh, rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. came out in 1970, and I guess about three years later, there was a, a movie that came out as well, the same name and everything, and it has some, really had some great music to it, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, if you're a little younger than that, maybe you remember the, uh, the TV special that came out, I think in 2018, it had John Legend and Alice Cooper and some other people like that in it, and uh, they played it again apparently last year on Easter, I didn't, didn't watch it, but I heard that they did that, and it's a, it's a really interesting kind of a play, because in this play, the, the, those who created it said that it's loosely based on the Gospels, and believe me, it's very loosely based on the Gospels, but that it attempts to show the, the life of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Judas, and Judas really wasn't very happy with the way that Jesus did some things, and we even see that in the scriptures, so, so I suppose to some extent there's a little bit of reality behind it, but um, I remember when the music came out, I loved the music, I was not yet a disciple of Jesus, and so I loved the music, I came to realize later that a lot of it is actually pretty blasphemous if you begin to understand it. But I also have realized over the years that the music there actually pretty well reflects what a lot of people thought about Jesus, not only in the time that he ministered here on this earth, but, but even today a lot of people tend to think of Jesus in the way that he's portrayed in that play. In particular, there's one song that's really relevant to this sermon series we're in right now. It was called um, King Herod's Song. And it, it has some lyrics like this. Here's some of the lyrics that you'll see in that song. Prove to me that you're divine. Change my water into wine. That's what we talked about last week, right? That's all you need to do. Then I'll know it's all true. So you're the Christ. You're the great Jesus Christ. Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. If you do that for me, then I'll let you go free. Finally, this one. So if you are the Christ, Yes, the great Jesus Christ, feed my household with this bread. You can do it on your head. Now, I'm not going to tell you that any of this is scriptural. It's not. The person that wrote these lyrics, a guy named Tim Rice, he, he claims that Jesus is not God. And so certainly it's not inspired in any way by, by God. But what I will tell you is I think these lyrics do pretty accurately depict the way a lot of people look at Jesus. And the way they look at the signs that he did, they wanted Jesus to, to put on a show. Or in some cases, like with Judas, they wanted Jesus to do some things to, 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 to perform some miracles that would make life easier for them. Things like overthrowing the Roman government, for instance. And so, so we see that that is even true today. There are a lot of people out there that are looking for Jesus to do something for them, to put on a show, or to make life easier for them. And unfortunately, it's even easy for that to kind of creep into the church sometimes. I mean, we look around in our culture in, in a lot of places, I'm not saying that's true everywhere, but in a lot of places, Christians have kind of become what I would call consumers of religion. And here's what I mean by that. They shop for a church the same way that they would shop for a car or a new house. And what they're doing is they're looking for a place that will somehow meet their needs, a place that will feed them, a place that will cater to their own personal preferences. And so really it becomes, like I say, they become consumers of religion. And, and as soon as the church that they're in fails to meet those things, they just go find another one. And there are plenty of options for them to do that out there. There was a guy that, uh, that wrote a book, David Wells, and in his book, he, he shared these insightful words about that. He said, we have turned a God that we can, uh, we have turned to a God that we can use rather than a God we must obey. We have turned to a God who, who, who will fulfill our needs rather than to a God before whom we must surrender our rights to ourselves. He is a God for us and our satisfaction, not because we have learned to think of him this way through Christ, but because we have learned to think of him this way through the marketplace. And so we transform the God of mercy into a God who is at our mercy. And I think if we're all honest, 
we can kind of fall into that trap sometimes, can't we? Now, this morning we're continuing with the second message in our current sermon series, which is called Seven Signs. And in this series, we're looking at seven different signs that Jesus did that are recorded for us in the Gospel of John. And if you remember last week, we talked about the fact that signs are not exactly the same thing as miracles. Sometimes there's some overlap. But hopefully you remember this definition of a sign that we gave last week. It's from the Greek word semion, and it's, it's an outward indication of a truth. Or it's something that distinguishes a person or a thing from others. And, and as John points out at the end of his gospel, Jesus did a whole lot of other signs. He did a whole lot of other miracles. But John records these seven because each one of them tell us something important about who Jesus is. They authenticate his identity and his mission and his message. And so this morning we're going to look at the second sign. And the second sign is really the antidote to this kind of me-first Christianity that we've been talking about so far this morning. And in order for us to understand that correctly, we need to kind of put it into context. And particularly, we need to put it in context with, with the things that happen in Jesus' ministry right before he performs this sign. And there's a contrast there that's going to help us to understand the meaning of this sign for us. Now, after Jesus performed the, the first sign there in Cana, where he turned the water into wine at the, the wedding, the one we looked at last week, John tells us that he went to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And that, that would have been common for all the, the able-bodied male Jews would have done that. That was one of the three feasts. They had to go to Jerusalem. So, so Jesus does that. And John tells us that while he's there, he performs a whole bunch of signs. And he says that some of the people there come to believe Jesus. But we know that that belief is shallow and short-lived. Because by the time we get to the end of John's gospel, almost all those people are going to turn away from Jesus. Some of them are going to even turn on Jesus. So Jesus does that, and then he heads back to Galilee which is, includes uh, the cities of Capernaum and Cana, as we're going to see today. And as he does that, he takes an unusual route. He goes through Samaria. Now, if you look on the map that's up here, you will see that Samaria is the most direct route to go from Jerusalem back up to the area of Galilee. But the Jews would never go through there because they hated the Samaritans. They considered them to be half-breeds. But Jesus, he, he, he has a divine appointment there. So he goes through Samaria, he comes to this little town of Sychar, and he has an interaction there, a conversation with a woman at a well there. This is all really unusual stuff. One of my, I think one of my favorite stories in all of Jesus' ministry and how he ministers to this woman. So he goes there and, and he does that. And, and this woman, after this conversation, she goes to the entire town. She says, you've got to come hear what this guy says. And because of the testimony of that one woman, it says that, that the townspeople asked Jesus to stay there. And Jesus stayed there two days, and as he shared with them, they came to believe in him. As a matter of fact, it says in John that some of them came to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, the reason that this is really unusual and why it's really important to the sign that we're going to look at today is for two reasons. Number one, the people who believed. Nobody, nobody would have ever guessed that the Samaritans would believe in a Jewish Messiah, but they believe in Jesus. The second thing, and this is even more relevant, is they believe in him just because of what he said. Jesus did not do one miracle that we know of while well, he's there in Samaria. He just, he just shared with them, and the people believed him because of his word. And it's with that in mind that, that we're going to come to this second sign this morning. So, so Jesus from there, it says he goes back to Galilee. And it, it seems like the people are going to really welcome him here. Here's what it says in John chapter 4, verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So it makes it sound like they're going to really welcome him here. I mean, they knew about, by now, they knew about the first sign. They knew about Jesus turning water to wine there at Cana. They knew he'd done these miracles there in Jerusalem. A lot of them had gone to Jerusalem and, and seen them firsthand. And, and it sounds really good, but if you read the rest of the verses around that, Jesus is not entrusting himself to them because he knows the only reason they're welcoming him is they want him to come put on a show for them. 
That's really what they're counting on. Or they're counting on him to come and do something that's going to make their life more comfortable. And as we're going to see, Jesus is going to have nothing to do with that kind of sign. Because the sign that he's going to perform, as we've seen before, is all about making sure that people look on that sign and they understand who Jesus is and that they put their faith in him. And my prayer for you this morning as we look at this passage is that it would take your understanding of who Jesus is to a deeper level. Take your intimate relationship with with him to a deeper level. That wherever you are in your walk with Jesus, that when you leave here today, that you would have a deeper walk with him. So with all that, go ahead and take your Bibles, open up to John chapter 4 if you haven't already done that. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 46 this morning. So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine, and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. I'm just going to jump right in this morning with the the main idea that I want us to take away from this passage this morning. And that is this, this second sign shows that Jesus is not the means to an end, he is the end. Jesus is not merely the means to an end. He is the end. And we're going to see here the story of a man who first comes to Jesus because he thought Jesus was the means to an end. There's no doubt about that. But by the time Jesus performs this sign, his faith is going to be come, to, come to a deeper level. He's going to understand who Jesus really is. And he's going to believe that Jesus is the end, not just the means to an end. So we see here that there's a, it says that there's an official here. And uh, we don't know exactly whether this guy's a Jew or a Gentile. I think he's probably more likely a Jew, as we'll talk about in just a moment. But the, the title he has there indicates he probably worked for a guy named Herod Antipas. And if you know anything about Herod Antipas, he was, he was put in charge of this region around there in Galilee by by the Roman government, and he was a hated guy. He's the same guy that's going to show up at the beheading of John the Baptist and the same guy that's going to show up at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so this official, his son is sick. The underlying Greek here leads us to believe that he had been sick for a long time, and now he's about to die. And you can understand, this guy, this guy is this official, he is desperate. In that time, when a child got a fever, there was a pretty good chance they were going to die. They didn't have the kind of modern medicine we have now. There are some historians that estimate that in the Roman Empire at that time, that only about half of the children that were born in the Roman Empire would live to be age five. So this guy's pretty desperate. And he hears that Jesus has come back to Galilee, that he's hanging out in Cana. So he makes the trip from Capernaum to Canaan. It's not an easy trip. As you can see on the map here, it's kind of you're going down from the, 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 the area around to the Sea of Galilee where Capernaum is, and you're going up these mountainous roads up to the town of Cana. It's probably about a 17-mile trip. It's not an easy trip, but he is desperate. And so he comes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, will you come with me? He asked Jesus to come with him. And Jesus' response seems a little harsh to us, doesn't it? Here's what Jesus says to him. He says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, that seems a little harsh. It, it's kind, of, it kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to Mary, what we saw last week. You know, what do you and I have in common? It's not my time yet. But the key to understanding why Jesus says this is you'll notice that I've underlined the word you there. 
And that's because this is a plural you. For Joel and the rest of you from the south, you could just substitute y'all in there and you would get that right. But he's, he's not just speaking to this official. He's speaking by now. There, apparently there's a crowd that's gathered around. Because remember, they want to see a show. They're there to see a show. So this crowd is gathered. And, and what Jesus is saying to them all is, all you guys want to do is see a big show here. He says, you're not going to believe. Just You're not going to be like the Samaritans who believe just because of the words I spoke. You want to see a show. You want me to do something for you. Seems harsh, but it was important. And we see here that this this official, that his faith is beginning to develop. Because <laughs> notice what he says. He next basically commands Jesus to come with him. He says, come down with me and heal my son. It's a command there. It's an urgent command. And I think Jesus is doing something here that he did with Mary. He's kind of testing out this guy's faith a little bit. Remember, he, he basically says to Mary, you know, it's not my time now. And what does Mary say? Go ahead and do whatever he says. It's kind of the same thing here. The official's like, I know Jesus. You just told me that I, I don't need a sign to believe, but come down to my house. And we're going to see why in a minute that, that, that he makes that demand on Jesus. And Jesus could have easily fulfilled that, couldn't he? I mean, we see in Jesus' ministry, he's, he's not too busy to do things like that. Remember right before this, he's just spent two days in Sychar talking to the Samaritans there. He was never in a hurry. And the other thing we see about Jesus is he cared for even one individual. He goes out of his way time after time to minister to one person. So, so Jesus could have easily gone down to Capernaum and healed the son. But Jesus has something more important in mind here. He wants the people to understand that what's not important is the sign. It's what the sign points to. Like we talked about last week, those, remember the billboards pointing our way to the thing. What's important is not the billboards, it's the destination. And the same thing was true with these signs. And so Jesus wants to do this sign in a way that's going to point to who he is and why that's important. And we know that in particular, I think Jesus is speaking to the Jews here because we know from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth that that, that was the nature of the Jews. Here's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.22, for Jews demand signs. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for a Messiah, and they were looking for signs. But Jesus says, no, I, I'm not going to do that. And so when Jesus says, no... I, he just says, look, go, your son is healed. And we see this guy's faith is being taken to an even deeper level now because guess what? He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't argue with Jesus. He doesn't say that doesn't make sense. He doesn't beg Jesus to come with him. All he does, is he turns around and he heads back home because it says here that he believed what Jesus told him, even though he could not yet see what Jesus had done. And as he heads home, he runs into some of his servants there, and sure enough, they begin to talk, and they figure out that his son had begun to be healed at the very moment that Jesus said that that was going to be done. And as a result of that, not only does this man believe, but his entire family believes as well. You see, Jesus does here what he had done with the first sign. Remember the first sign? Who did he want to believe with the first sign? Remember, it was four people, four disciples. He did one sign so four disciples would believe. Here he does another sign so that one family will believe and put their faith and their trust in him. And what started out was somebody coming to Jesus because they wanted him to do something. They finally realized that Jesus was not just the means to an end, but he was the end. Do you see why we've said that this morning? Why that's the case? Now, in this, in this account, we find that there were two possible things that were, that were distractions or two possible obstacles for the, this man, this official, and his family. And Jesus is going to overcome both of these obstacles, and not just for the sake of doing that, but because when he overcomes both these obstacles, he's going to demonstrate something about who he is that's not only important for that official and his family, but is crucial for us to understand as well. 
the first obstacle was the obstacle of distance. This guy didn't have any idea that Jesus could heal from 17 miles away. He figured the only way Jesus could heal was to come with him, which is why he first asked him, and then secondly, he demands for Jesus to come with him. The second obstacle here is the obstacle of death. That's a big obstacle, isn't it? He figured that his son was at the point that unless Jesus showed up there, that his son was going to die. He figured only Jesus could do something about that, which is true. And the way that Jesus overcomes both of those obstacles demonstrates to us some things about Jesus that are important to us. I'm going to leave you with just two of them this morning, but I think there are two really big ones. The first one is this, that he's not limited by time and space. Like I say, Jesus could have gone there and healed, but he wasn't about to do that. He wasn't going to put on a big show. I find it really interesting here that nobody else other than this official even goes to see if the son is healed. Nobody else really cares. Once they figure out Jesus isn't going to put on a show, they don't really care. And because of that, they miss out on the fact that Jesus is not limited by time and space. He could heal from 17 miles away. He could heal from 170 miles away. He can heal from 170 million miles away. He's not limited by space and time. And you know why that's important? Because you know the only person who is not limited by time and space? It's God. Not, we're all limited by that. Every human being is limited by space and time. But God is not limited by space and time. And so what he's revealing here is that he is God. And I think that, that the official and his family understood that because of this sign. Now, they didn't understand everything about Jesus at this point. They didn't know he was going to go to the cross and die. But they, they knew that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh because of this sign. And that was absolutely crucial. Second thing that they understand because of this sign is that he's the giver of life. He's the giver of life. This is not going to be the last time that Jesus heals somebody with one of these signs. Matter of fact, this idea that Jesus is the giver of life, it's going to be expanded and expounded upon as we go through each one of these seven signs. But you know, every time Jesus did a physical healing, even when he raised Lazarus from the dead, every one of those people eventually died, right? None of them are alive today. But that healing, that physical healing, is a picture of what Jesus wants to do in our lives spiritually. In the same way that he shows mercy to this man and this man's son and this man's family, he shows mercy to us. Because the Bible tells us that all of us at one time, we were spiritually dead. And we couldn't make ourselves alive, even if we tried. Those of you who are in our Bible reading plan this week, remember we read about that in Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead. And we couldn't make ourselves alive. It's like that. We have a defibrillator at the back of the uh, auditorium here. And if somebody was to pass out or become unconscious here, someone else could take and use that defibrillator. But you know who can't use it? The person that's unconscious or laying. They can't use it on themselves. And the same thing is true for us spiritually. We can't do anything about being spiritually dead on our own. We have to count on Jesus to do that. And that's the picture he's giving here of what he came to do spiritually for each and every one of us. So here's some questions that I want you to ask this week. And a lot of times when I, when I, when I encourage you to ask some, answer some questions, I'll think, just give me the first thing that pops in your mind. Well, these are not that kind of questions. I want you to really think about these. I'd encourage you, find some time, some quiet time this week where you could get along with just God and consider these things and to pray about them with God. Ask Him to reveal the honest answers to these questions and then ask Him to help you to respond as He would lead you. So, so I've got four of them. Here's the first one. Am I trusting in Jesus for what He can do for me or am I trusting in Him because of what He has already done on the cross? Here's, here's how I think you could probably get an honest answer to that question. What do you pray for?
What are you praying for? Do you just pray when you need something from God? Like he's some big genie in the sky? Or do you pray and give him thanks for the grace and mercy that he poured out on the cross? Do you thank him for what he's already done on that cross to make you right with him and to provide eternal life for you? So that's the first question. Here's the second question. How is my relationship with Jesus impacted when he does not answer my prayers the way I want? Essentially, that's what happens here, right? This guy asked Jesus to do something, and Jesus does not do it in the way he wanted him to. And often in our lives, God will not answer our prayers in the way that we want him to or the way we think he should. And when that happens, we can do one of two things. We can either trust that Jesus has my best interest at heart. We can trust that what he's told me in the scriptures, that he loved me, that he loved me enough to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. We can believe in the promise that says all things that work together for the good of those who love Jesus and who have been called according to his purpose. Or we can say, God, uh, that's it, I'm done with you. So we can ask that. Here's the third question. Am I a religious consumer? Do I treat my relationship with Jesus, like I said earlier, like buying a car or a, a house or something like that? Am I only in it so that I can get some kind of personal benefits out of it for my own life. And then finally, one last question. Do I take Jesus at his word? I love what this this official does. When Jesus tells him to go back to his house because his son is healed, he just takes him at his word. He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't question that. And there are going to be times in our life when we're going to read the Word of God and there's going to be some things in there that we don't fully understand. And the question is, will we take Jesus at His Word? Will we obey what we do know, even when we don't have all the answers? I'm pretty convinced that if we, if we really see Jesus as the end and not just means to an end, that we'll take Him at His Word. So we've seen this morning that the second sign shows that Jesus is not the means to an end. He is the end. Now, we've talked about this before. And I, I'm included in this group too, but some of you, and like I said, I include me, you first came to Jesus because he was the means to an end for you. There was something you wanted from Jesus. And you know what? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The problem is if you stay there. And you don't come to the place where your relationship with Jesus grows deep enough that you understand that he is the end and not just the means to an end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this second sign. Thank you for what it reveals about Jesus, that we can be confident that he is indeed God in the flesh and that as such, he has the ability to give life, not just life here on this earth, but life for eternity. And so my prayer for all of us this morning, Father, is to honor, that we would honestly evaluate our lives. That we would try to understand the best we can whether we've just made Jesus a means to an end or whether he really is the end. And Father, if he's only been the means to an end, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of those people. Help them to understand their need for Jesus as their Savior. Help them to understand that Jesus alone is enough. Pray that in his name. Amen.